Thank you, Rick, very much for that. Um, so we're just about to go on to our next one, which is the uh, panel about hybrid working. Uh, but uh, just a couple of announcements. We'll just get that panel uh, prepared. Um, I should mention that um, Rick is excellent at explaining how an Oxford-style debate is supposed to operate, but it doesn't always operate that way. So um, you take your chances. Anyway, it seemed to be a li lively and interesting discussion in the end. So that's great. Um, so thank you for that, Rick, and the, and the debate team. A uh, couple of small announcements. First one is always the same announcement, which is please fill in the survey. Um, if you're using the on-air platform, um, you'll find a link to the survey in the platform. If you're not, then um, we'll provide a link. We're going to email out to delegates uh, tonight or first thing tomorrow, so you'll find the survey link in there. Um, so please do update that. We really do value your feedback. So that's um, extremely important. Um, so um, almost more important, a reminder about the scholarly social in the pub at the Marquis Cornwall, which is about three blocks away from here. So if you want to go in there after the conference, that would be great. We finish up here at um, about 5.15. Um, you're welcome to stay here um, in the Great Hall if you're here, and online people are welcome to uh, be in spatial chat. Uh, and indeed, if you're here physically and you want to go online and chat to the online people in spatial chat, that's cool too. So there's an opportunity to just out and chat, um, but then, uh, it's uh, off to the pub for people, I think. Um, that's, uh, that's the announcement. Um, so um, what else to announce? Uh, it's 24 degrees. I know that's very important to people. Who's too hot? Who's too cold? But like, so like 95% happy with the temperature in the room. This has never heard happened before. Can you put that in your survey? Please, when you fill out the survey, so you're totally happy with the temperature in the room. So that would be enormously valuable. All right, I'm looking to the back of the room to see how AV is getting on, and they are... Was it a thumbs up? That was a thumbs up. They are ready to go. So now over to Alison and her panel of experts on hybrid workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the interim. I guess the one advantage of uh, being at home in your home office, you get to have the temperature just as you want it. <laughs> so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, we're pleased to be here to explore a topic that impacts every single one of us, regardless of where or whom we work. Um, we've heard a lot about the future of work over the last couple of years. I think the phrase itself is so potent because everybody wants to know what it is. By definition, it's never actually here. During the upheaval of the last couple of years, the future of work, whatever it looks like, has felt just that bit closer than before. And for me, these past couple of years have been one of rapid learning and frequent recalibration. One of the hardest things, I think, has been designing for a world that doesn't yet exist. And the views of management and employees are still very much in flux. We've seen this clearly at PLOS. We'd actually conducted a couple of surveys of our UK and our US staff in autumn of 2019, as we had leases to renew on both our offices. And so we've got good pandemic baseline data. We've conducted four surveys since then, and it's amazing to see not only how much views have changed, but how much they're still evolving at this point in time. One of my fundamental philosophies as I've been thinking about individual aspects of work has been to ask, do we want to bring this with us into the future of work? And if there's one key learning me so far, it's that hybrid work is really hard. All in the office or all remote are much easier in many ways. But I also believe that hybrid is the future for most organizations. And so we have to learn to become excellent at it. I also believe that we can create better cultures and organizations if we truly embrace this change. Part of the reason people don't want to come back to our offices is likely that they weren't inclusive systems to begin with, particularly people from underrepresented backgrounds, for introverts, and for newly hired employees. We can use shift to hybrid as an opportunity to identify those gaps and to build better, stronger cultures. It's also a moment for us to take seriously ideas that have been previously dismissed as impractical and idealistic. For instance, there's a really interesting experiment underway across dozens of companies who are systematically listing out a four-day work schedule. Others are addressing the completely realistic expectation that emails and other messages should be responded to quickly, if not immediately. 
Not only is it unreasonable, the constant interruptions steal our ability to focus and make us far more productive. There's also a clear lesson for leaders, one that was arguably clear before the pandemic, that leadership isn't about technical expertise and having all of the answers. Besides articulating a compelling vision, it's about being human, showing vulnerability, connecting with people, and being able to unleash their potential. I'm lucky to have four thoughtful and smart leaders with me today to explore some of those issues. So Jane, I know that you've been thinking a lot about how your leadership style needed to adjust. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Thanks, Alison. So uh, I'm going to be a little bit personal here. Uh, I've been a leader for quite some time, for four or five years. Um, I, I just want to share some reflections on what it's, very brief reflections on what it's like to be, uh, what it has been like to be a leader uh, in the hybrid workplace. Um, I, I mean, I, in the last two years, I think I've employed every single leadership style in, in the book. So really quick and transformational in terms of my own personal development. So, what I, you know, I went from being a democratic leader, encouraging encouraging participation back two years ago, to being a coaching leader, mentoring people through you know, trauma in some cases to, to commanding, setting procedures around mask wearing, health and safety, to being where I am now, which is, I would say, probably try, trying to be visionary, trying to inspire stuff through change. Um, I, would, I would add as well, um, uh, in, in terms of, of what I learned, is that I'm not afraid to ask. I'm not afraid to ask anyone now. I need to learn. I need to ask my colleagues. I need to ask my networks uh, 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 for help, which I don't think I would have done quite steadily um, pre-pandemic. Um, just want to say a little bit about change. Um, we have to rewrite that fear book as well. There's a few more bubbles that we need to put in uh, in the hybrid workplace when we're talking about managing change. It's got an awful lot more complicated to me. Anyway, it feels a lot more complex and complicated. Messaging is difficult. It's challenging. Um, it always, always was difficult, but it, it's even more challenging because people are in, in different places. They're um, not physically necessarily, but they're in, they're in different places. Um, my teams have very much gone from norming back to storming. So um, it's very difficult to find that internal team drive that you get and want when you're managing change. And one last point that I wanted to talk about with libraries. Um, libraries, we very much relate to buildings. Some of us have only have one library. So we very much, when, when we're trying to work together as a team, as a single team, a whole team, we very much coalesce around our building. And many of us, that has been broken. Um so that relationship which, allowed, which helped us do that single team single team working approach whole team working approach has has has, has gone uh, and and you know it's not it's not a bad thing I think this leads with with a, with a challenge really is how to how, how to approach single team working I guess in the hybrid world which is where I am at this moment today. Thanks, Jim. I end up. I think you have a different focus from, from a library perspective. I know that you've had to focus on aspects of leadership, such as strategy and financial management, um, where you are. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's looked like, what your key takeaways have been? Thank you. Uh, libraries naturally have always had that hybrid of being physical and being online. Um, but but now we are being forced to be more online to, to shift the ratio from being more physical, giving spaces, in space uh, services to um, more online services. For example, I'll give an example of my library. At the Botana International University of Science and Technology, initially we had a policy, a collection development policy that was driving towards having 90% of our collection being electronic and only 10% being uh, in print. So we were more, our objectives were to driven towards building the collections. Now, because institutions have had a serious budget cut and people have learned to operate online, there is no point in building physical collection as much as Yes, we can build it. It's not as pressing as it was before. So 
So now the focus is no longer on collecting development, but on service development. So I informally in my head, uh, which like, like Jane said, we have learned to be very flexible managers. I've learned to be very flexible in my head and I've told myself it's 90% of services online and 10% in print. And that has brought a whole lot of applications. It means advocating for the online infrastructure, having online policies, and teaching others, even ourselves, how to use it, how, how to operate online. So it has brought in a whole lot of uh, trial and error services. As a team, we have adopted an approach I personally call we fail together, I fail quickly, and move on to the winning stage. And, and we have learned also to start having short-term plans as opposed to long-term annual plans for the delivery of a project. Because the services are so dynamic now. So these short-term plans, and remember I say, it's less quickly so that we move on to win. And they have to be short-term. But unfortunately, due to budget cuts, short-term projects are more expensive than long-term ones. And you don't, we actually are operating from a zero budget because the budget has had to be cut. So those are the complications that we meet. But the beauty of it is we have learned that we need to get out of our box. We, if at all, there was a box. We have learned to network and now we have seen the need to profile our stakeholders. Who are they and who do they bring and what are we taking to them? So we have profiled our stakeholders and it has even helped us to have a strategy for engagement with our stakeholders. And then amongst ourselves, we have now seen the need to grow ourselves. I tell you about six team members. We are a small team because the university is fairly small. It's a it has a population of about 2,000 students, just about 2,000. So the library team is 17. But out of those 17, seven have enrolled in formal online study because we've seen the need to grow ourselves. So the, 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 the lockdown and the restrictions and everything has really opened ourselves. And we are all have affiliated ourselves with different library consortiums, library associations, because we realize that without these other people sharing the collections and share the resources and even teaching our users, our users particularly how to go into the open access platform, because we realize that due to budget cuts, we cannot afford to pay for the consolidated databases that we had before the, the budget cut. Uh, I think in a nutshell, that's the quick change that had to happen. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ayanda. Just in a slightly different perspective here, I know that you've had some really interesting thoughts about how we can change and really improve our workplace cultures um, based on what we've learned through what we've been through. Um, what are your key learnings? Um, I think one of the key things that I learned is that, you know, when you go back to the opening conversation about how this is just a human experience and really relying deeply on, you know, these human aspects or these the, the natural evolution of the human. So for me, one of the major takeaways from the past few years specifically um, have been understanding how grief works and not just as it relates to an individual's loss of something or a person, but almost in this larger idea of what we're all experiencing, I think, on a higher level of work culture. And, and that's grieving in general. And if you're not familiar with the stage of the grief process, um, there are five stages. Uh, the first two and the first two are um, denial and anger. The third is the bargaining stage, which is actually where I think we are collectively in the workplace now. Uh, however, as we move forward, I think we'll enter a period of depression. Um, acceptance is the final phase. And I said because uh, right now, if we're, as we relate to this burning phase, this is where we are all one life somewhere return to where it was before. Um, that's exactly the stage that I think we're in now. And I hope we move towards the stage of acceptance. And in that phase, it doesn't mean that we're all going to agree or we're going to think everything's right. Um, but it's just be a matter of accepting, accepting that what was will never be again and like all being on one accord with it. Um, and in that sense, I think as we're moving uh, further into this, 
we we start think about uh, virtual first as an option. Um, I know all of you are in person, and, and this is very exciting for me to experience it in this way. Um, but I think we all gain more from that sort of experience because it comes a matter of almost accessible designing of everything we're doing. Um, and if you're not familiar with accessible design, um, and that's making things user friendly for everyone as it's established. Um, so as we're navigating this thing and refer to now as sort of a hybrid approach to, to um, uh, even workplace culture or even meetings, things like that, uh, we should probably start getting geared up to see things uh, for um, a more universal acceptance experience and a more inclusive experience. And, and that's how I see us sort of moving towards those types of design and models. Um, so it's not to remove in-person first. We've had years doing in-person first. I think we've had very limited time of doing virtual first and then starting to focus on what term we come up with to define what we now refer to hybrid. I don't think that's what we'll call it in days to come. I think it'll have a new definition um, and it'll be somewhere it relates to something we don't know now. Of course, hybrid has an existing definition and that's not really what we want either. Um, again, as we move closer into this acceptance of where we are and getting us, you know, I think the next stage is really depression and grieving the complete loss of everything that was moved into that. Um, and then as we're talking about moving into that, uh, we talked about skill, leadership skill development. I think it's not about just skill development. I think it's about moving skillfully. Um, we're going to require some sort of development of skills. Me personally, I just lean towards vulnerability as my personal skill that I've been trying to ramp up. Goodness, um, because as we're moving into this new world, I think types of soft skills are going to be very, very critical. Um, everyone hears about EQ or emotional intelligence or EQ as it relates to emotional uh, quotient, actually. Um, there's a lot of uh, elements of of emotional intelligence that we'll have to develop as not just leaders, but as a part of a leadership group. I think we'll start to see more flatland approach to um, works in general, um, and, and it won't be hierarchical in ways. Um, I think that also yields, again, this virtual first, virtual idea, this new type of environment that we're working in. Um, and as we start to talk about like weaving different things into the culture, I, when you set sort of foundation, it's, it starts to naturally establish itself. So again, I think as we're uh, seeing these things through and we're moving forward in this hybrid workplace environment, um, just a few things um, to really consider as we're navigating this. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, last but not least, Kofu, you, you sit in a slightly different position in that you're a HR and you're supporting many of us who are sort of leaders and managers as, as well as staff um, over the last couple of years. What changes do you see needed in both people management and in organizational cultures? People management, we really need to think about how we communicate with people differently now in this new world. I think it's ever more, it's so much more important than it used to be because I used to sit next to people who was very easy to build relationships, you know, stuff like that. But in this new world, we have to really consider how do we introduce people into organization? What is the culture that we want the new organization to have as a result of the changes? How do we design that culture? And we should never underestimate the role that HR plays in those communications. Alison mentioned earlier the fact that, you know, a lot of us are doing consultations, but what do we do with that information? What are we actually trying to find out from the consultations? Because it's an opportunity not only to get the feeling of what your staff think, but also for you to put to them what you feel your new culture should be and to help in the building of that new culture, which is very, very important. Communication is key. Who are we and how to get there? We have to do it. Today. We cannot separate those in this world at all. When it comes to managing people, which we've all talked about, there's definitely a lot of training that needs to happen. Because managers do not know how to manage people based remote. We don't. A lot of people do not know how to do that. So we are learning and we have to learn, but it's not hard. Um, so that's another training incentive that we definitely need to push in this world. And, you know, to see how we can make sure it embeds in the culture, how it embeds into who we are, and how we identify who we are through our values in this new world. Thank you. Thank you, Kofa. So 
We want to make sure that we've got plenty of time for questions here. So we're sort of going to move into, into part of the, the program. Um, please do, uh, those of you who are there in the room, um, you can ask questions. Uh, I think there's a microphone there. <laughs> um, but you can also um, use the platform to ask questions online. And of course, of you who are online like us, please just use the platform to enter your questions. Um, we've got a uh, first question here. Um, this is an interesting one because it's one uh, we're actually thinking about quite a lot at PLOS at the moment. Do speakers have any tips for onboarding staff in a virtual environment? Um, I think something we found really challenging, especially for junior staff. And one of the things I, I worry about is how difficult it is for somebody if it's their first job or very early in their career. Um, onboarding in this way just isn't the same kind of level of coaching and support and connection that, that you get. So I, I'd love to hear any, any tips that the speakers have um, for us on that. Who, who would like to dive in there first? I can go first. Um, so from an HR perspective, I think my first tip would be onboarding starts from day one. So from the moment you have accept that this is someone that's joining your team, you start the onboarding process. So you're thinking about how you're communicating with that person, what equipment they're getting, what is their setup, it's all part of making them welcome to the organization. Thinking about the policies as well, what are the benefits that they're going to get, that is all part of the onboarding process. And you see all of these things. You let them know how they're going to communicate. You even let them know what policy is when it comes to video um, meetings. Is your camera on? Is it off? You let people know all of these things from day one. And then from day one, it is very important that you arrange meetings, be it coffee, chats, with different parts of the organization, the departments, different senior managers, um, so that they can start to understand who you are, how you do things, and why you do things the way you do it. Also get to actually put names and faces together. You know, you have to do that. It's from day one. And it can take up to three to four months, which is a longer, because organizing all of these meetings is difficult getting into people's diaries, but it is crucial in, in this time. May I add something as well, Alison? Yeah, please, um, just go ahead. So just full caveat, um, I actually managed uh, remote prior to the last three years. So for me, I had to figure that out without any guys or help. So Kofo, thank you that this is now being considered from the HR perspective because void of information, it was a lot of winging, if you will. Um, but I'll also add just addition to the points that Kofo just made, um, that you should give the person a lot of lead time, yourself, your team. Um, and kind of be prepared for that. So Co says start the day that they're hired. I start a little bit before sort of arguing with your team what it might look like and um, setting up some preliminary meetings at, with, with your team members because I think that's a part of the look that you have now is you don't have in-person feel. Um, so there will be a lot of chatting, a lot of chat. Set them up meetings with everyone on your team. Um, I know some people have very large teams, for example. So I think about the like the top 10 to 20 stakeholders. And it might sound like a lot of people to communicate with. But imagine yourself having this downtime. You're just starting. You're probably going to be able to fill that 10, 15 minute chat with a lot of people the first few weeks. Um, and it really does let them see the persons and they get to see each other. Um, I also say add a lot of um, preliminary um, SOP documentation. So I went back and took everything we would normally use in person. And I really put links and apps and videos. I've added that to a bit more interactive um, for someone onboarding. And um, the last thing I'll say is making sure that you have a schedule for them. Um, for myself, I take them through the first four weeks of their employment. Um, and I give them a week by week sort of example of what they'll be doing, who they should link out to, um, some preliminary material. And again, you have to think about some of the disadvantage to this virtual space is you feel like you're not using your time wisely or that someone is not aware of your timing. I think that really helps when you set a schedule for them so they'll know which milestones they're supposed to be meeting throughout the week. Um, it keeps them a little bit more focused and engaged. Um, and they don't have that, am I being busy, am I being too busy, um, sort of feeling that you get here um, in this virtual space, if you will. 
I think we have a question in the room uh, there at BMA House, so over to whoever wants to ask that. Hi. Can you hear me? Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. It's a really, really interesting panel. And um, what the what couple of questions, I think I'll try and do it very quickly. Um, so it was fascinating, I think, hearing Jasmine talk about um, grief. And I really, um, I think there's a lot of, I hadn't thought about the workplace in this sense until now. But I had the um, opportunity to, to take part in a session with relative caregivers recently. And one of the things that struck me listening to Jasmine was that some of the discoveries been made by the experts, and we're talking about doctors or nurses, is that actually the, the real needs of those affected by grief or, or death and dying aren't re revealed necessarily to the experts who ask what they think are the right questions. They're, they're often revealed to uh, volunteer um, companions, for instance. So it's, I think it's really important in the workplace, probably in the future, for, for us to realize that networks that aren't top-down potentially are the places where we're going to find out the real needs of, of employees. I hope that makes some sense. So, so making sure that there are peer-to-peer -peer networks that can, that can happen probably in person as well as online. The other thing that um, I'm thinking a lot about is networking. So lots of the needs of, of employees aren't around the work, they're around networking and talking and, and the social side of life. And I th I'm just wondering if all, I run Scholarly Social, which is tiny, and I know Alps and SSP and other organizations try to get people together in different ways socially. I'm wondering if the few organizations might have responsibility in the future to bring people together that and it's not at work, it's about talking and, and um, communicating. So maybe they may have some resources to do that, that go beyond their own workforces or, employee, or employees, but maybe can bring us all to as a community in some way that I haven't quite worked out. I hope that's helpful and relevant. Thank you. Uh, Bernie, I think you were a couple of really interesting points there. And one of the things I've thought about over the last year or two is, you know, what I would call the weak ties in organization. And so they're the ones that sort of the water cooler moments, the, you know, the people you chat to when you're getting coffee in the kitchen or something. And I think these are the ones that we're missing. And there's a social component to those, but there's also a work component to those, the, the connections you wouldn't make that you don't think of. Um, because they are, you know, they, they are just sort of ones that there isn't an obvious connection. And I think we've really missed those. It's interesting. I was in San Francisco last week and, um, you know, we've got a few people coming back into the office and we're kind of pizza in the uh, outside a plaza lunch on Friday. And I was just sort of chatting to our staff come in and asking what this most. And they looked around and said this. And so it was that moment, social connection with their peers over a pizza or over, you know, you're at the end of the day or something. I think you're absolutely right. That that is a that social connection is a is a part of work. And I think it contributes to productivity. It's not just about what makes us feel good being there. But I'm interested if any of the other panelists would just like a, a quick comment to anything you said there. Jane, do you? Yeah, that what, what Bernie's really resonates, and, and yes, it, Jasmine, that was brilliant, actually. I, I wrote all down to try and solve my issues. Um, so, so I think that um, it's what we're trying to do, and it's what I mean by this is all really challenging, and we try to get that internal move going, because what we know is the top line approach doesn't work. You can't force people to socialise. You can't force people to have those, just and those, that, that, you know, that, that working together to solve problems and to, and to move on from the, those stages of, of grief that you described, Jasmine. So I think where we are at the moment is, is literally saying with with our staff is, is taking them out of their, their teams. And there's about 120 staff taking them out of their teams saying, look, you can go and spend a day over here. Here's a budget. What do you want to do with that? How do you want to do that? So really give them the ownership of what that is. Absolutely, it does not work if, if we say, okay, we've got free and coffee over there. Does anybody want to come in for so much? It does not work. It's about giving them ownership of those of those 
the, of that time when they can socialise and of that time where they can work together and talk to each other. I think what's really different though is, is being able to hear what's happening. It's really hard, you know, it's really, and that, that is physical and the remote, but also hear your, hear your staff. And that might be me as how, how I did leave. It was about being part of the staff and being part and to hear and to be open and available. Now it's really difficult to hear them. Yeah. Ayanda, do you have a comment you wanted to add there? Yes, thank you. And I, I was very interested when she mentioned the the need to reach out to, to the, the team members, to the staff, get to know your staff very well. To give you an example of what we did in my team, when I realized that my team was getting a time of online meetings, because a lot of these online meetings, and um, first before the online meetings, uh, institutions I, I tend to take care of people physically. They would just say those underlying conditions should be not allowed to come to the workplace or do this for the underlying for those underlying. But they are referring to the health, physical conditions. But amongst us as team members, we get to know who is more weaker emotionally. So then we developed teams amongst ourselves to keep on checking each other. And you know, the emotionally weaker ones, they would not want the director to keep on them. It's very difficult. So we had to find ways of reaching out to even the introverts. Even the extroverts were needing help because some of us, I'm, I'm one of those experts. I couldn't operate when I was locked. So we had to find networks of reaching out to each other. But most importantly, then I started avoiding for about two weeks or so. I was avoiding a meeting where we were talking official his work. Then I invited somebody from the, with legal expertise from the legal office to talk to us about the will, and then they started giving. So the discussions became more lively than because we are talking about power issues. We then invite somebody to talk about the, the psychological issues that go with the trauma of losing our loved ones. People were really losing uh, family members. So we shifted from talking office work as a group. We were just talking personal development, personal or emotional issues. And that helped until we were able to get back on track. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to, I think we've got one question in the room. Um, Simon, Simon Holt. Um, can you hear me to start with? I'm assuming you can. Yes. Um, yeah. Great. So I wanted to build on the question that Bernie asked before. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Holt. I'm with Elsevier. Um, Bernie talked very eloquently about what I'd call belonging in the workplace, and I think that's really important. But also I'd like to talk about belonging within the community the scholarly comms community and also for some of the subject domain communities that we work in and with as well. One of the things I noticed the pandemic was um, the greater equity and quality uh, we saw when people, uh, into people who were able to participate in meetings like this. So for example, because it was online and people didn't have to travel, so the cost of participation was less. You found that companies would send five people instead of two people. As we get back to either a hybrid environment within our, our industry or an in-person environment, I'm worried that more junior colleagues or mid-career colleagues won't be able to go to conferences, won't be able to get the kinds of experiences that we've all benefited from in our career. So I wanted to get panel's opinion about how can we retain some of the benefits of online in terms of equity, greater inclusion, more people being able to participate in the discussions that happen within our industry, whilst still managing to get back some of the things that we all enjoy that are to do with personal connections, um, in person, physically being in the same place, bouncing ideas off each other, etc., etc. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. I mean, I think that's, that is one of the biggest challenges, right? Because 
you know, I, I was there in person with everyone, right? If I, you know, I, I have to be at a meeting next week and I couldn't risk being stuck with COVID and I am in London. So I'm here in my office again, but I would really want to be there. And I, I think that, you know, we all have this longing to reconnect, but you're absolutely right. There's a way in which um, the, the pandemic has been the great equalizer from the perspective of being able to participate seen that within our own organization um, you know those of us who are who have been remote for the first time now really understand what it was like for the 20 percent or so of employees that we had remote before the pandemic you know what most of the time it sucked because our entire sort of work ethos you know we sort of knew they were there but we didn't really take enough um you know, enough notice of what that experience was like. So going forward, we've shifted a number of things. We have a rule that every, if one person can't be there in person, then we're all remote. So that, you know, we all have that same experience. You know, when it comes to these kinds of events, I think it's, I think it's challenging. One of the things that we're doing is trying to repurpose funding. So we have downsized both our offices. Um, some of it happened pre-pandemic, but they're not 100% net savings. We're trying to think about how do we use that so that more people can travel. Maybe it's in different ways. So people aren't necessarily going into the office to their focused work, but there's more that they're available to bring teams together a couple of times a year. So I think it's I think it's rethinking what work looks like and how we use some of that funding and not thinking that, you know, oh, we've got less office space, therefore, you know, we've got all this, you know, sort of savings. Really thinking about how we can support people people in, in working differently. But let me open it up to others on the panel who'd like to comment on, on that question. Um, yes. Hi, um, Simon, I, I love that you introduced belonging. Um, belonging is a concept that goes directly into diversity at conclusion. Some people add additional acronyms the B with an additional one, um, belonging. Um, I love the idea of belonging. Um, for again to some of these things that I just delve into of vulnerability and but belonging for me it's not just a sense of equality or equalness or leveling the playing field. I think that's like a step in the process. But belonging has a natural to the individuals. And belonging is to set in when they when a person feels like they literally belong, that they are included in it, that they have bond to whatever it is that you're gonna, you know, start to embark upon. Um, I think it's critical to workplace culture. We're talking about it. If you've not started to dive into belonging, it should be your thing that you're like kind of diving into. Um in general, I think when you ask how do we uh, create a set of that or how do we uh, as we're moving forward make sure we're introducing that or keeping some of the benefits we've we gained you know um in this of this pandemic which i think there were far more gains if i can just put on the record than there were losses we, we won't probably see them all just yet um i think that you do it by introducing the things that i don't know some of the things that at my organization we started to do is when we started to see it we started to take action um so as a result to some of the things that happened we put things in place that will for for my organization means that we're we're not going to be able to go back to where we were so we're not really worried about you know, perpetuating the things we've done in the past if anything we have all these new things that are introducing that almost makes it um um, impossible for the return. I'm not going to say impossible. It, there are lots of things that are impossible, but are possible that are seemingly possible. Uh, but one of the benefits, I think, at least within the science space, that we started to create smaller working groups. So when you ask about a sense of belonging, you get that when you find groups that you associate with. So for the people that are not Traverts, if you will, myself not being one of them. Smaller groups are a little bit more approachable. And I think the virtual environment has given us the opportunity to have these people meet no matter where they are in this virtual environment. Again, creating a more sensible game. And when you introduce that back into the works, you'll start to see that. Um, in that same spirit, um, I think you can't, for my organization specifically, I have the same thing about these meetings. We have more money in the budget now to send more people. I'm not going back. I mean, if that means that my team continue to have remote meetings and more people can go, I have to weigh what I what am I gaining. And I think that's what everyone will be weighing. Um, one of the things that I would like to see starting to happen is that we have more smaller remote working groups. So right now we see you all working in this segment here. I think it would have been neat to have that type of environment 
will be everywhere where if you did go to say in person meeting you'd go to the real chapter closest to you the much smaller group because i think a lot of that anxiety that is introduced with the pandemic um that will be reduced in that way um and when you make smaller groups you have those natural conversations you get a sense of belonging and i think that will start to penetrate um everywhere everywhere it goes um so I think that's how we start to you know, maintain some of the gains, keep them, introduce this sense of belonging or, you know, continue to maintain the belonging. I think all of those uh, will start to naturally happen as long as we stop trying to move backwards and continue to, you know, forward, if you will. Okay, I'm going to go to, we've got one last question that I think can sort of squeeze in before we, uh, before we need to wrap up to keep everybody on time. Um, there's a question from Jason Mitchell that came through the chat. Are there any additional ideas and suggestions for encouraging, motivating, infusing colleagues and developing a more supportive community and ethos remotely? Um, so I don't know if ever, you each have ideas, but maybe we've got time for one quick idea from, from each of you. Who'd like to jump in? I can happily go first. Um, yes. I think we definitely need to listen to people and find ways to engage people. Um, one of the things we introduced was reg check-ins with every member of staff trying to figure out what exactly they are, what counseling they need, support they need. We realized very quickly that that actually kept them age because they felt listened to and they've heard. Um, so that is definitely when it's, it's difficult because it's time consuming, but it works. Um, listening to people it helps to motivate them. Also, not being realistic with your requirements and your demands. I think working from home is a real test of what flexible working really is. We need to be realistic with when people can work, how they can work, and how much they can actually produce. If they feel sorted, they will be engaged. That's a simple one. Anyone else like to jump in? Shalaka. Um, so this is, I mean, this is based on experience, really, and, and speaks to something about uh, that flattened hierarchy. So it's getting away from silos, which is possible working as a single team, um, working together and, and, and not going back to actually what we all went into, certainly in universities. In, you know, we, we all did emergency. Um, we all kind of went into our little teams and, and, and coped in our teams. But actually, you no, know, we all need to work together as a, as a single team with a more flat hierarchy. And, and, and that's not easy. That's not an easy thing to do, certainly not in organisations like universities it takes forever but we that's that is where we'll go that will be our future our hierarchy will be will be much flattened and we will work together different ways and not in those silos team silos as much as we're breaking that up anyone stand up or jump in one last quick comment that's well that's well it's it's very important to appreciate each other. I think starting points just getting to know each other and then learning how to navigate. Like I said, my team we we seem to have agreed, not written that we we are ready to try out anything as long as we try it together and we take ownership. It's it's very difficult if there is no ownership of whatever. Uh, trial project that you want to do. Because it's a total shift of mind. And for me, my concern, I, I think lately I've become too much talking about lack of funding. But the lack of funding has really hit me hard because I'm in a public funded university. And when government cuts on sponsorship, and then students also resort to learning online. It really impacts uh, my, my service vision a lot. So I've learned that it's very important to make a team with my with the co-workers, make a team with the service recipient, and then make a team also with the those who provide services to me so that I can provide a service. I'm, I'm so much now in relationship building. I I think that's a beautiful thing that has come out of here. So way forward is relationship, relationship, relationship. 
Thanks, Ayanda. And I, that is a perfect place for us to wrap up. Fortunately, I think we could keep talking for, for a long time. Um, we can keep a uh, chat going online. The social chat is going to be open for people who want to keep uh, going for conversation online. Um, the Great Hall there on the ground is open for chatting until I think, six o'clock. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone to complete the survey. Um, there's a link in the on-air session information. And there'll also be a link that's emailed out to delegates to keep up with that. Also, those of you who are there on the ground, and here's the part I miss most about kind of the in-person part, the scholarly social will continue in the pub later, um, the Marquis Cornwallis Pub. Um, so enjoy for those of you who are able to, to attend that. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, my panellists for sharing their thoughts um, and also our Fabulous support moderator behind the scenes, Mark Allen, for feeding us our questions and keeping us on track. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the conference. We'll see you tomorrow.